about hardware. So, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, round of applause. Can I, can I stand up or the camera will... <laughs> no problem? No problem. Like, I, I, wanna, I, just, I don't want to talk about just economics, because I think we're, we're going through a seminal event in, in the history of the country. Okay? Uh, I, I just want to talk a little bit about how the, you know, the whole revolution started, and then I'll get to the economics, and then we'll go back to the revolution. Okay? So, the WhatsApp tax, in my opinion, the whole thing started a few weeks before the WhatsApp tax. So my view is it started when they, when they, when people were going to the banks trying to, trying to get dollars out, and they weren't able to. And then what happened was they started enforcing an archaic law about not insulting the currency, not insulting the banking sector, not insulting the system. So they, and in fact, they started grabbing people. One, one of the people that was grabbed was a guy who retweeted something I tweeted, by the way. And they grabbed him because of that. Now, they didn't do a whole lot with it because the country is not that dictatorial, but they made, you know, they released the guy, they made him sign some, you know, a, a, a document that I'm not going to do this again, and, and he had to remove whatever he said, even though what he said was the truth. So it was an attack against free speech. Now, as you know, <coughs> the Lebanese people in general, they, they they sustain a lot of abuse, right? We don't have electricity since the end of the war in 1990. And what do we do about it? We joke, right? Remember the, the message from the UDL, you know, enjoy the darkness, uh, you know, it's romantic, blah, blah, you know. So everything we do is we always joke around about it until it gets to be too much. And one of the menus recently for people to vent against problems is WhatsApp. You send videos and jokes. Every, it's probably 90% of the bandwidth in Lebanon is about that. So it started with first banning free speech or grabbing these people, then the WhatsApp tax, in my opinion, the combined thing subconsciously was telling people you can't even vent. And that's what I think is what spilled over other than the cumulative problems of the last years and years and years of corruption, okay? As, in terms of the economy, Lebanon has always been a country that was supported by, by you guys, by, 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 by expats. And in my mind, education in Lebanon is sort of like African Americans in this country their way out of the hood was basketball, right? Our way out of the hood was coming to MIT. Because, I mean, if you look at the path, you guys all here are maybe on F1 visas, and then you go to a place like MIT, and from MIT you get an H1 visa, and then, blah, 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 and the next thing you, you're, you're citizens, and then the next thing you know, you're sending money back to Lebanon. That's the formula. The formula of our parents, the formula of our grandparents. And the system worked marvelously well until 2006 where the money that was being sent was enough to sustain the bank, to sustain the lifestyle. In the old days, our parents and grandparents, they would work in the Gulf. And in the, I'll give you some stats. In the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, a, a civil engineer in the Gulf, mid-level, a little bit above mid-level, was making something like $120,000 a year, which in today's money is something like three-quarters of a million dollars. Can you imagine a civil engineer graduated from EUB today to make three-quarters of a million dollars in Saudi? Right? So, the other issue was that in the old days, again, in the days of my parents or your, your parents or what have you, the Gulf was not very uh, accommodating in terms of entertainment. Usually, there was the family was in Lebanon, the, 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 the man, who was the man, the man was alone in Saudi, UAE, Qatar, uh, and because there was nothing to do, they would save 80% of the salary and, and remit it to Lebanon. That was the model. So, they would work there for five. There's no... 401k, there's no IRA, they would just save and save and save, 5, 10 years, and usually 5, 10 years was all it took, and they would move back to Lebanon with a chunk of money, and they would they live off of that, and that's how the country sustained itself for a long time. But since then, a couple of things, a couple of magical things happened. Like, I remember when I was in Dubai in 2008, 2009, every major bank, the operations, Middle East operations was run by Lebanese. So, Goldman Sachs, Lebanese, Standard Chartered, Lebanese, Deutsche Bank, Lebanese, uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, you name it, it was a Lebanese person running the Middle East and North Africa operations. Fast forward today, there's only two banks maybe that are run by Lebanese. What happened? What's different? What's different is a couple of things. One is competition came in from South a Southeast Asia. So Indian graduates from IIT, IIM, Pakistanis from IBA, which is the, the Ivy League, the equivalent of MIT, these schools, they were now competing with the AUB graduates. They were getting paid less money, working harder, whining less, expecting to be promoted uh, 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 less fast, demanding less. And as a result, they started to displace us. 
And in addition to this, the bubble of the last 10 years occurred in Lebanon, whereby the salaries in Lebanon became so artificially high in, in banking and real estate that it wasn't so attractive anymore to move up. So the guys that would have replaced me as the man who ran the Middle East and North Africa, uh, you know, usually that he would have been nurtured in Dubai. The guy didn't move. The, the potential uh, man or woman that would have replaced me did not move from Lebanon because this person was already made. I mean, I know people that would have replaced me and they weren't. They weren't moving. Okay, so that's the economic part of it. Now, back to the, the issue of remittances. So remittances up until 2006 were basically balanced. The money was enough to sustain the uh, uh, trade deficit or the balance of payment deficit. Now, something magical between 2006 and 2010, partly because of the global crisis, there was a surplus of $20 billion that came to Lebanon. $20 billion that came to Lebanon. Now, what that, well, here's, here's what, the, I mean, this was, a, in my opinion, a transformational moment for Lebanon, because this money could have, there could have been a lot of things done with this money. Instead, it went into wasteful projects, like the towers you see in Lebanon, the multi-billion dollar projects that are empty today. So $20 billion was blown on the real estate bubble and government waste and increased uh, uh, benefits, increased employees, etc. So that's what happened, because they assumed that this was going to go on forever. Except what happened in 2011, suddenly it turned negative. So now the balance of payment from 2011 until today, until this morning, has been negative every single year. Except for one year, which year is that? Uh, 2016. Why? Why? What happened in 2016 to reverse it and make it positive? Financial engineering. Financial engineering. That was the giant financial engineering. Now, as you guys know, how many engineers in here? MIT, yeah, okay. <laughs> so in Lebanon, in Lebanon, every person has to become a physician, engineer, or lawyer, right? Or marry one. <laughs> so if, if that's the case, when somebody says in Lebanon, I'm doing a financial engineering, what is the first uh, impression that you guys get? Oh, this has got to be something good, right? It's engineering, right? Except what is the financial engineering? I, I, I compared it in one of my articles to the Kama Sutra. <coughs> it effectively, you know, every chapter is a different position, but the end result is the same. <laughs> so what is the end result of the financial engineering? It's trading dollars for lira at a rate other than 1507.5. That's it. If, you know, like a, like a swap, 2%, 7%, this is all nothing. What it really, really was is just give me some dollars, I'll give you lira, and except I'll give you more lira. I'm not going to give you 1,500. I'll give you 2,000, 2,250. <clears throat> what did the banks do? The banks took the difference <clears throat> between the 2,250, and they're saying that lira is 1,507. So if I was sold lira at 2,207, who's the trader here? That's a profit of 2,207 minus 1,500 divided by 1,500, right? And they took that on their books. The top two banks in Lebanon, I'm not going to name them because I'm being reported, but the top, <laughs> the top bank made $856 million out of the financial engineering of fake, fake money, Disneyland money is what I call it, okay, which is printed lira. Uh, the top two banks made over a billion dollars. In fact, if you look at some of the banks, some of the top banks, you'll see that if you, if you take out the financial engineering transaction, they basically lost money. The core functions of the banks lost money. Now, this, because this is fake money, right? It's printed lira that doesn't even get distributed. Except what happened? The bonuses that were paid were real. So the chalets that were bought in, in, in Faraya were real. The villas in the south of France were real. It was a great life. So, <clears throat> of course, there's another reason. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the other side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that this was a bailout. So the, some banks got into trouble. And the, the impetus for, the, for the, the first financial engineering was to bail out a couple of banks. Nothing wrong with that. That's part of the mandate of the central bank. The only problem is that what he did was he gave them free money. There was no accountability. For example, when, when the crisis of 2008 occurred in, 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 in the United States and in Europe, uh, what, uh, what happened was they, the, the UK government took ownership in RBS. They controlled bonuses, right? They might have even fired management. In Lebanon, nothing like that happened. They were just given free money. Now, if you give two banks free money, what are all the other banks going to do? That's for money. I want some of that too. So as a result now, this whole big Disneyland world uh, uh, opened up and everybody was, was doing this and it became, and it's like, and I, I compare it to addiction to cocaine. You know, I don't want, you know, it's like New Year's thing. 
then it becomes New Year's and Thanksgiving, then it becomes a weekend thing once a month, then every weekend, then every day, right? And that's what happened. So the financial engineering transactions started to become more and more common and more and more dense. And, and this was creating an, an incredible amount of debt on the country. <clears throat> In fact, the deposits are about $170 billion. Okay, we know this from, it's public information. 110 billion of that is with BDL today, 65%. 65% so of the deposit are BDL, except BDL does not have a magical way of producing revenue, right? Does he have, is, he, is he putting it in Google, IBM, hot dog stands, selling hot dogs? What is he doing with it? Nothing, it's being spent. Where is it going? The money is going basically, every time you are an employee of the government, you wanna to go to Turkey, you take your lira salary, you convert it to dollars to go to Turkey, right? You get the dollars from the central bank, the reserves, and then you go and spend it in Turkey. You want to buy that jacket, same thing. You want to buy your car. Basically, everything that we're doing in Lebanon, because we don't export anything, because the manufacturing base, the, 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 all the production that we had is all destroyed, okay? Because part of the reason for that is the cost base is high, right? Uh, as a result of that, all these dollars are flowing out, and now there's an addiction. We need more dollars. We need more dollars. And the system worked as long as more dollars were coming in. Now, Nassim, Nassim Talib and I have called this a Ponzi scheme. <clears throat> the definition of a Ponzi scheme, some people have disputed that it's a Ponzi scheme. Let's look at the definition. The definition is of a Ponzi scheme, if you, if you Google it, is fraudulent investment scheme whereby old investors are being paid excessively high rates by new investors. That's the definition, right? So it's pretty clear that it fits all those definitions. It's an excessive amount of interest, yeah, and it's too good to be true. It's too good to be true to pay 15% on dollars in Lebanon when the whole world is a zero interest uh, environment, right? Clearly, you cannot make more money than Warren Buffett in a fixed uh, uh, return with zero volatility, right? Who, who are the MIT financial engineers here? Mm -hmm. uh, can you make 15% in Lebanon in, in a country where the economy is shrinking or flat? Can you make 15% and it's there's no volatility? Is it doable? Huh? For a little while. Is it legitimate? It's a, it's a, is, it, is it a legitimate return? Okay. So that's what it is. Now, the, the, of course, it's not fraudulent. Why am I saying it's not fraudulent? Because when the, when the person that came in with the, with the money, the 10 million for the 15%, he wasn't promised that uh, he's in being invested in widgets. The guy said, you're going to make 15%. He didn't say, oh, this is a startup at MIT, Silicon Valley uh, startup that makes 15%, right? He didn't ask. He said, oh, 15%. Yeah, that makes sense. He put it in. Right? He didn't ask where the money's going. The banker didn't know where the money's going or didn't ask. Most of the bankers didn't realize. Oh, it's a central bank. Well, what's it doing there? Nobody asked. So the fraudulent part is missing, but it doesn't change the, the essence of it. It's a Ponzi scheme because old investment is being paid by new investors. Okay? So where are we today? The estimates are that 50% of the money in, in, the, in, the, in the banking sector is gone. Okay? Now, some people will dispute that. Right? I'm sure that some people, even in this room, find that strange. Maybe not MIT graduates, but if we were in an average place in Lebanon, they would dispute it because the banking sector in Lebanon, the essence of the country, what do you mean it's a Ponzi scheme? Right? It's not believable. When I say it a lot, I don't believe it. Except when you go to get the money, it's not there. I mean, the evidence is right in front of you. You know what I'm saying? There's $170 billion in the banks. The banking sector is lending out $60 million of it, right? Usually, what happens? Usually, in the normal banking sector, you would have, uh, you know, 60 billion, let's say, in deposits. You would lend out 55 billion, right, or 53 billion, right? Isn't that how it is? With the rest being reserves. So in yeah. Lebanon, we're only lending out one third of the money, less than one third, 56 billion dollars, something like that. If you lent out, out of the 107. Well, okay. So where's the rest? It should be liquid, right? What's the central bank? Well, what's the central bank doing with it? We know where the lending where it's going. It's normal. It's credit cards, auto loans, mortgages. Uh, business loans, etc. right? That's where the 60 billion is. Well, where's the 110? By the way, how do I know it's 110? It's on the BDL website every two weeks. Okay, what percent of the 110 is dollars? As of May, it was 62 billion. How do I know it's 62 billion? It's not published, how do I know? Fitch, the Fitch report published it, okay? So there was an argument about publishing it. You know, they asked them not to publish the, 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 the actually not, not, not that number. They were going to publish the fact that the reserves were net negative. You know, the reserves that are being reported are the gross, right? You know what the difference is? Everybody know what the difference is between gross and net reserves? <coughs> or shall I go through it? 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so th- let's say uh, let's say I lend you a hundred dollars. Okay, you take that hundred dollars and you spend forty dollars. How much do you have left? Sixty. MIT graduates, man. <laughs> <laughs> you have sixty dollars left. But so you and you can show me. You can take out the sixty dollars and say, look, I got sixty dollars. You show it to me, right? That is gross reserves. But what do you really have? You have 60 minus 100. Your net reserves or your net amount of money that you have is minus 40 because the other part was blown. If you put it in an investment in widgets, you can get it back. In hot dogs, you can get it back. But you actually spent the money. It's gone. So that's the difference. Now, what Fitch realized was that the net negative reserves was $32, $33 million. That's not the end of the world, by the way, end of the sudden. Okay? In the, I mean, it's a lot of money for a country that has a GDP of 55, 56 billion, but but it's not the end of the world. Net negative reserves is something that can happen, except it's a little bit high in Lebanon. Not a little bit high, it's quite high. <laughs> but, so, the, the, they asked them not to publish this number because they thought it would create a, a big deal in Lebanon. The fact of the matter is that, in all honesty, because most people study engineering or medicine or lawyer, right, they don't know what that means, anyhow. Right? So, as a result of this, they made a compromise, they only published the 62. So you needed to go one more step to figure out the net negative reserves. You have to subtract the 62 minus the 32 to get the net negative reserves. You see what I'm saying? And a lot of people missed it. It wasn't even published until there's a couple of papers that published it, but in general, it wasn't published. And it didn't make a big sensation. People didn't understand what that means. Okay, so the, 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 the system itself then is basically there's a lot of debt. We know about the 86 billion. Everybody talks about the 86 billion dollars of government debt, right? Everybody repeats it, 86 billion, 86 billion. But there's another piece of debt that's not talked about, the stuff on the balance sheet of the central bank, which is 110 billion, it's even higher. The dollar portion now, we just said it's 62 billion in May. I think it's, by now, it's probably about 67 billion. That's more than double the euro bonds. Euro bonds are 29.8. So the actual debt in Lebanon in dollars is over 100 billion. The total debt is something, there's some overlap here. So we, we, let's say it's about 180 billion. So that's the part that was missed by a lot of the rating agencies and by a lot of the analysis, etc. And now they start to catch on. You'll notice now, so all of a sudden now, there's a lot of banks that are start, starting to publish about it. The, the rating agencies start, you know, you know, they started to zone in on it. Before, like, if you go back a couple of years, nobody was talking about uh, the BDL al balance sheet that much, right? They were talking always about debt to GDP ratio. That's the most common thing that is, that is. Okay, so as a result of that, this is, we're getting to the, to the problems that we have now. <clears throat> of course, what I call this, the, the, the financial engineering world, I call that Disney world. This is a lot of monopoly money being generated, okay? Disneyland. In the real world, the world of where you go to the gas station, you fill up your car with gas, that's the real world. Where you buy syringes for hospitals, that's the real world, right? Where you buy grain, where you buy bread, that's the real world. So what happened here, because, because all of these guys the fake money and the, 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 the real needs are all competing for the same real dollars in Lebanon. What are the real dollars? You have the reserves in the central bank, which are about, plus or minus, about 30 to $35 billion, right? And in the euro bonds, you don't count them. You know, have you been to a steakhouse recently and given a euro bond? If he takes the euro bond, that's cash. If he doesn't, it ain't cash, right? So the cash is less than the 38.6 that he reports. It's, it's about... 35 billion plus or minus. Then there is the, the, bank, the bank's money at the custodial accounts. Bank of New York, Standard Chartered Bank, uh, J.B. Morgan. That money is estimated, we don't know what that is, we think it's somewhere between three to $10 billion. So the total amount of, of real dollars is something like 40, 40 and change. So what that means is in dollar terms, there's only one out of three real dollars. If you include the whole 170, remember, Unless there's a devaluation, you have to include the whole 170, right? So at that point, now you're talking four to one available dollars, okay? So how do you solve this problem? How do you solve it? Devaluation. There's still 130 billion, 125 billion in the banks, right? So devaluation will solve this part, but not the big part, this part. So how do you solve, how do you create these, how do you create these real dollars? How do you pay people back? How do, how do we solve the matter of problem in America? You increase the interest rate, get more fresh dollars. So you continue, <laughs> continue the policy. Okay. They, try, they tried that. It didn't work very well. I mean, 
<laughs> yes, that is the solution until it stops, right? So if it stops, what do you do? If if there's a spiral back now, you know, you, you keep doing it, and then so what do you, what happens when it starts spiraling backwards? How do you solve it? Start getting back all the stolen money. <laughs> the stolen money and the and the like they say. That's not. she. That's not. It's 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 a romantic notion. Okay, it's a romantic notion, but it's quite difficult to do. Quite difficult to identify. You know, there's been some numbers thrown around. Who's heard the 800 billion dollar number? The 300 billion dollar number. Have you seen that? Mm-hmm. There's been some articles written about this shit. Have you seen it? I mean, it's not 800 billion means if somebody stole the whole GDP of the country <laughs> in the last 20 years. You know what I mean? It's it's nonsense that's been published. So it's not. We don't know what the real number is, and it's quite difficult to prove it. It's quite difficult. that's not that's not going to be the solution. How do you solve the Ponzi within the Ponzi? You borrow money. You borrow money to Paris for okay. So you go to you're gonna to go to the Congress and you're gonna tell yeah. them I need to borrow some money because I got some guys that earn fifteen percent, twenty percent, twenty five percent on dollars, and I wanna I don't want them to default. I wanna pay them their money back. That's what you're gonna do. Anybody remember why Lehman Brothers was uh, was not bailed out? Who remembers why? Did you guys study the two thousand eight financial crisis? So Bear Stearns, which is where I work. Was was taken over by J.P. Morgan. Was prevented from failing. Right? What happened at that point? Everybody started screaming. Moral hazard. Moral hazard. Remember that? So then they let Lehman go. Right? And when Lehman collapsed, the whole world collapsed. So then TARP came in. You know, and they started throwing money left and right. Right? So there was the moral hazard issue. So if you come in to do Paris Four, Paris Five, Paris Six, like you're saying, to bail out depositors that were earning 15 or 20 percent, right? Do you think that would be very palatable in the United States by the EU or U.S. taxpayers? Right? It's not going to work, yeah? Okay, so how are we going to solve it? Haircuts. Haircuts. There you go. So you, it's basically, you need to haircut. You need to, you need to, you need to basically tell the guy that, who, who, that, basically, a guy earning 12%, if, he's, if he's got, he had $10 million 10 years ago, today it's $31 million. Okay, who's got a compounded annual rate calculator to do it? It's $31 million. Right? If you haircut him by 50, by, by 50%, he's got 15 and a half. That would be about 4.2% interest, which is acceptable in interest. That's what, he doesn't even lose any money at this point. So you haircut this guy. Do you haircut the guy that was earning 3%? But didn't this guy already get his money out of the country? We'll talk about that in a second. I mean, the, 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 the buses are still 107. Some people got out, but it's not as big as you think. And if people think you know, they got out, they, they, there are people that got out, and, and they should be sought, but it's not as much as you think. The, the deposits are essentially the same, 170 billion, okay, plus or minus. So what you do is you, 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 you haircut, I mean, there's two ways you could do it. There's not two ways, there's seven ways you can do it. So the first way you do it is you haircut anybody above, say, a uh, million dollars. You, you take a haircut 50%. That's one way. Simple. And that's say you don't touch anyone below a uh, million dollars. Second way you can do it is you can you can haircut anyone who earned excessive interest. So you'd say, okay, anyone who earned double-digit returns, you get haircut by, and it, we'll call it a deferred one-time tax, by the way, to make it look, you know, respectable. So you, you hit the guy with a with a with a tax rate on the interest of say 50 or 60 or 70 percent. Okay, anybody earning below 10 percent, between say 8 and 10 percent, you hit them with a tax of 30 percent, and anybody below below 8 percent, which is a reasonable rate for the risk in Lebanon, you you don't you don't touch. Them. You can do it that way. Same result. Okay? A little bit fairer. Like the, there could have been a guy at 500,000 who was earning 15% because he had Wasta, right? And you could have had a guy at 2 million who wasn't doing it because they didn't negotiate properly, right? Right. The third way of doing it is forced conversion to Lira of all deposits and all uh, uh, liabilities, right? The problem with that is. You don't like that? It's just, she's got the emoji look on her face, you know, the round one? <laughs> my, my favorite emoji. So you you, 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 uh, you you convert everything to Lira, right? But basically what happens there, the Lira is already trading at today's 2200, right? So you effectively haircut everybody equally, right? Sounds fair, except you hit the low guy the same as the high guy. So the, the other way of doing it is, uh, this is not my idea, it's, it's uh, Professor Reinhardt at Harvard. She's an expert. She wrote the book, This Time is Different. So her idea, I gotta look at it a bit more, but her idea is basically you convert everything at two different rates or three different rates. So the, the little guy, 1507, 
the the you know bigger guy two thousand, the the guy who benefited from financial union at three thousand, whatever. And that that's effectively different haircuts, and it deals with the with the problem of the currency. Another way to do it is you convert everything like Cyprus did to shares of the banks, or partially. Another way is you because because Lebanese don't understand time value of money. Who's heard a who's heard who's heard <laughs> of a uh, who's heard of a guy in real estate who will tell you I want to sell my apartment for a million dollars? You know what? I'm not in debt. If I don't get my price, I'll wait ten years to get my price. Have you heard that? Who's heard that? This is a guy. This is a guy who does not understand time value of money, right? If he sold it today for five hundred thousand, he would have one point three million in ten years, right? So if you tell a guy I'm going to haircut you fifty percent, or you tell him I'll pay you every penny of your your ten million dollars, but I'll pay it over twenty years with no interest, which one will he pick in Lebanon? Even though even though they're equally mathematically, you do the math. They're mathematically equivalent. That's your mind, right? So that's another way of doing it. A conversion, treasury bonds, conversion. You know, there's a whole slew of ways. But again, Kama Sutra, <laughs> they all amount to the same thing. It's a haircut. So effectively, what we're doing is we're reducing the monopoly money down to a level where the available real money can cover the claims against it. That's it. That's the solution. And that's this solution. The good news is that we don't have an, we don't have a major problem. The, the foreign debt in Lebanon is below ten billion dollars. I've already said to you that our debt is probably about one hundred and eighty billion. The foreign debt is somewhere between five and ten billion. That's it. It's nothing. So, in other words, ahli mahali. And we need to have a conversation. It's like, look, the money's gone, man. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. That solves the problem. That's it. Good question. So, how did we get to the 180 million? Uh, the 85, 86 plus the 110 in the central bank minus the overlap. 110, which is not already a 110 plus 90 minus the overlap. A few bonds uh, among the banks and, and other stuff like that. Plus some, plus some loans that can come back. You know what I mean? I just threw out 180. It could be a little bit more, it could be a little bit less. And if, for example, the loans, 60 billion, some of the. By the way, let's talk about the loans. In the, in the private sector. So I'm going to give you some some cool information. So there's a little bit under sixty billion dollars in loans at the banking sector to the private sector, right? Who can tell me what is the direct uh, um, the direct amount the the percentage of that that's directly real estate? Who can tell me the percentage? Yeah, and it uh, direct means developer and mortgages. Who can give me the number? Do you know? Thirty-eight percent, something like that. Okay. Right. Who can tell me what is the exposure to real estate indirectly? What does indirectly mean? Indirectly means I want to open a coffee shop over here. I want to borrow from the bank to open the coffee shop. So far, so good, right? In the U.S., you just give them the business plan and you borrow and we're done. In Lebanon, what, do you, what, what else do you have to do? Collateral. Collateral. Of outside that, your grandfather's piece of land or something like that. Now, if you include that, what is the exposure to real estate of the, of the, of the loans? Huh? 90 percent. That's the right number. How did you know? Guess. Yes. It's 90, it is ninety percent. And you can get that number. I think it's page twelve of the IMF report of two thousand seventeen. I can uh, I can send it to you guys. So hey, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so. So not 90% of the loans are real estate. What that means is, is there anyone that doubts there's a bubble of, you know, there's been a bubble in real estate? I, I know there's sometimes there's, there's always one guy who's going to argue this. Is there anyone who believes it's not a bubble? No, real estate is not a Real estate is Hey, but and does anybody believe this anymore? Anybody in this room believe that? Come on. Nobody believes it? Not bad. MIT is not bad. So as a result, a lot of these loans are upside down. Who knows what that means, upside down? You know the term? Have you heard the term? Upside down, and when the when the more, when the loan is worth more than the asset. Okay. So effectively, all these. You know, okay. Let me give you another number. If you go to the to the financial statements of the banks, they'll tell you that the non-performing loans is like two, three, four percent, something like that, right? Okay. If you read the Akbar newspaper did a report on it, they came up with fifteen percent NPLs on every category of loans except person, except individuals. Which was about four percent. Okay. Now, judging by the people you know and friends, do you believe those numbers? Do you believe that it's that low? Who believes it's twenty-four percent NPLs? Yeah, it's much higher. Okay, it's much higher. In my opinion, the NPLs in Lebanon are probably one third. 
or the lightning sector. Okay. Now the good news. So the first piece of good news is that this problem is a mathematical problem that anybody in here, an MIT guy or gal with an Excel spreadsheet can solve it over a weekend. It's a mathematical problem, nothing more, nothing less. That's the good news. The other good news is we don't owe that to anybody externally. The third piece of good news is that we can actually get rid of some of the monopoly money. How? Okay, so I've got I've got a million dollars in the bank that I can't take out, right? This is the rules now. I can't take it out. I can't transfer it outside, right? But I can I can write you a check and buy stuff. I can buy your phone with it. I can buy the the desk. I can buy the laptop, right? That that you own. I can't buy a laptop from outside the country, but within the country, I can I can trade monopoly money, right? Now, people are starting to know that this is monopoly money. But how, where when when is the monopoly money valuable? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be, be specific. You're right. So, what, what, when, when would be, when would somebody like him want to sell a piece of land for a million dollars in monopoly money? There's, a, there is a case when he would want that money. Anybody can guess. When this guy is owes the bank a million dollars, right? Because the monopoly money can cover the. That is, you answered it, but you were general. So the mono, the million dollars can cover the million dollar debt. So as a result, now this is there's going to be some cool stuff happening. And you're going to see stuff. They're going to have cases on this, man. I promise you. <laughs> so the, the, I will sell him my land for a million dollars. He will, he, will, he will accept the monopoly money, even though he knows it's monopoly money, because he can pay it to the bank. Now he's, his loan is gone. So as a result, you're going to see a lot of movement of, of debt reduction. <laughs> okay? Now here's the other issue. How about I pay you for the land instead of a million dollars of monopoly money? She comes in. She's been working at MIT. She started a startup. Stock options, next thing you know, she's worth $100 million. So now she's going to pay you real money in an account outside Lebanon or in cash. Benjamin Franklin's in. She's, she'll pay you 500000 for that piece of land. Would you take my million? Let's say you don't have debt. Would you take my million or her 500000 Your million? million. You'd take the monopoly money? 500000 500, Wouldn't it get stuck somewhere in the system, the dollar? I should pay you in Switzerland, man. I'll pay you cash? Here. Cash or, or money? Cash. <laughs> <laughs> She's not going to transfer it to the country. She'll okay. pay you outside the country. In fact, this is already happening. It's called, I mean, I just named it haircut trading. So effectively, what people are doing are saying, okay, the haircut might be 40 or 50 percent, but I'll, I'll buy it at a discount of 25 percent, 30 percent, whatever. Now, I mean, you guys are MIT guys. You know how you, you know how you construct option. Have you, you've done op who's done option in the pricing here? You know, with the thing with the trees and all that, right? Okay, so if you want to if you want to construct what the what what it should be worth, right? Can you replicate it? So let's say you so you today if you go to a bank in Lebanon, you tell him you got a million dollars in dollars in the bank. You say I want to take out my money. What's his, he's going to say no, right? Right. But he say I'll, you know, after you argue with him, he say I'll give them to you in cash in lira. So, so you take the million dollars in lira, and you you go you go over and then you go to the exchange house, the Sarraf on Hamra Street. You give him the, the lira, he, he will give you a, a rate of 2,000, 2,200, whatever, right? It's changing every day. And then now you're back to dollars, but the dollar is no longer a million. It's yeah. now 600,000 or something like that, right? So that's effectively a haircut, right? So the haircut, you know, the, in the haircut trading, the price now is look, is correlated with the, with, the, with the lira rate because mm -hmm. that's how you replicate it. I've heard you mean that Sarafs are taking checks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same thing. For, same, for principle, that thing. same principle. So what does the Saraf do with it? He's going to find the guy who has a loan. Yeah. I So this is why I'm saying there's going to be a movement towards this stuff. There's going to be a movement towards two tiers. So real estate in Lebanon is actually in monopoly money will rise. In real money, it will keep, keep increasing. It will be a two-tier system. I have a question for your haircuts. So practically speaking, what would be the challenge, do you think, on, on applying it or enforcing it? Uh, I mean, tracking accounts and... When, when it was open, the interest rate that has happened in the past, and then practically speaking, you know, uh, practically speaking, you just ever agrees. Okay, okay. Pra practically that, that, speaking, by name, you say a million dollars and above is fifty percent. So you simplify. You simplify. That's one way, but it's not fair. Even for those who deposit it's like not last year, it's not totally fair. Yeah, it's not totally fair. So that's why I'm saying, if you put in a lot, a lot a little bit more work, it, beca it can become more equitable. And the, the interest is tracked because remember, there's tax and level on interest, right? So you you already know. That there's ten percent interest, so you already know what the interest is every year. So you can actually track it, and you can reverse engineer it and find out exactly who you should hit. So if it hasn't moved, if it hasn't, if it's you can do this. All, it's all, it's all, yeah, it's all doable. You get a forensic accountant, accountant to do it, and you can go in and you can find out the stuff and do it. The challenge, though, is not this. The challenge is the today there are there are not there there aren't capital controls that are official. 
In fact, what they're doing is illegal. Yeah. It's not enforceable. And when he tells you, you cannot, you know, you tell him I want to transfer my money, he says no. He has absolutely no legal basis to do that. Simple as that. So what does that mean? That means when he tells you, you accept it. You yell a little bit, the security guy will kick you out, and you're like done, right? And then somebody makes a call, Sheikh Flan, Beg, whatever, and then and then hey, take care of this guy for me, and this guy, his money's out, right? So the the one of the things we're we're asking for is to close the loop, you know, to to lock it up so that the, the these wasta guys don't get out. Because the more wasta guys get up, the more the haircut, the the bigger the haircut, and the lower down it goes to people that shouldn't be hit with it. Okay, so it has to be transparent. And now a lot of a lot of politicians from the existing system have, have, have jumped on the bandwagon. A few of them just issued a tweet saying the same thing. Should be transparent, should be for everybody. So it's not like, you know, activists like me. Now there are mainstream people that realize that this is a big problem. Yeah? And is that the challenge you see Can you identify yourselves? Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, is that the challenge that you see in forcing? Like the good news, I'm a, I'm a rule-based guy. If you if you if you issue the law, you know what I'm saying. If you issue the rules, it doesn't matter. Is that people cheat? Like, I'm not, you know, when, when when the rules are established, at sooner or later you can track it. Sooner or later you can you can come back and deal with it. The important thing to me is just that you issue the rule. I realize there will be loopholes, and I realize people will cheat in our system. But it's a start. You know what I mean? You make the rule, and then it's a start. As, and you have to remember that these things are tracked. And in the grand scheme of things, you know, the teller knows what... Remember, I got a lot of leaks from the banks. Of you know, the, There were low-level employees, mid-level employees that saw, for example, when the banks were closed. How do you know? I tweeted once about the cash transaction. How did I get that? I mean, there are there are people that... Not all the bankers are bad people. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, there's some stuff that happened at the top levels out of you know, permission or commission. You know, or out of stupidity or uh, uh, nefarious. I don't know. You know, I don't know if they were stupid or they were doing bad shit. But one thing's certain: the guy at the, you know, the teller doesn't know this stuff, right? The teller thinks he's in the most noble profession in Lebanon, the most prestigious profession in Lebanon, right? The mid-level person doesn't, right? So in fact, about a year ago, they were very upset at me. But today, there's a lot of support because they're like some of these guys that were their, their dream to work for a bank, and they're saying, you know, what have these guys done for me? You know? So there's a lot of people now that are that don't want to, uh, you know, that don't want to, uh, they don't want they want to do the right thing. So I think it's trackable. If you do the rule, it's trackable, and when it's trackable, you can you can claw it back. I don't know, but you know the central bank. I know the central bank has, in my opinion, the central bank has the authority to to execute capital controls. Okay, and I've spoken to some people that work there. I spoke to bankers. I had a meeting with them a couple weeks ago. We had a debate about this. They claim they don't have the legal right. I, I told them bullshit. You do. It's in your mission. You can do it. And even if you don't, even if it's a gray area, make the rule. Do your do your duty. Let somebody take it to court. Let somebody overturn it. Overturn it. At least you've done your duty, right? But they haven't even tried. You know, like why wouldn't you try? So I I think that then they went to the second stage. They said, look, if we execute capital controls, the people are outside demonstrating. They will go up and they will do this. And that. I said, well, the, the guy you're affecting with the capital control. Is the one worth ten million dollars? He's not demonstrating down there. Trust me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So in fact, you you do it, and then you leak that you did it to protect the little guy, and then you might gain some brownie points with the guys that are screaming at you downstairs. So it's a positive for you. So the third theory, that's what they said, by the way. This is a real conversation. So the third theory is, and that's my theory now, is that they, he doesn't want to piss off six thousand of the richest people in the country. You know, he, you know what I'm saying? He, he's already. It's a sunk cost. He's already thinking, okay, these all these people now hate me. Now I'm going to piss off the 6,000 rich people. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe that's the reason. And then the government itself, you've got to remember that the government itself, who wants to be the person that gives a speech to his political party saying, guys, it's been a, it's been a nice party while it lasted. We we're going to devalue the 5,000. I mean, you know, you want to do that to your sect, sect that you... <laughs> that you rule. You want it to you, know, you want it to happen and somebody you know, I'm gonna blame it on him, he'll blame it on him, you know what I'm saying? So in some sense they outsourced it to, to the central bank, to Riyadh Salim. You know? But is he solely responsible for the whole thing? Of course not. Because they knew what he was doing, right? Uh, 
have two questions. One, uh, your shirt. Identify. Mm -hmm. Oh, how sorry. Hala Hala. I wrote it already. Um, is your shirt from the 90s? <laughs> <laughs> It's new, but it's uh, it, I, I just like I said, I got a, I got a, uh, I got a job offer from them, and uh, I think it's appropriate to wear it here. <laughs> for this for this so. um, the second is around uh, devaluation. So you dismiss it a little bit as a financial answer. Is there an economic uh, impetus for doing it from the perspective of making the economy or the product maybe re, um, you know, re encouraging uh, production? Yes. Locally? It's an excellent question, and I'm glad you. I, I, didn't, I forgot to mention it. It's, it's an excellent question. Uh, let me tell you the. Let me tell you what people say about why they're against it. So I've talked to the people from the central bank about it, other bankers. They, the answer is always it'll create a riot, riots in the country if you do it. Blah blah blah. Right. And on the surface, superficially, it looks it looks correct. Right. You're making a thousand. Suddenly you're going to make three hundred dollars a month. In riots. Right. Well, but one of the things they don't do when they when they do this calculation is that unemployment rate is thirty percent, forty percent among youth. Right. So, for the perspective of the 40% that are unemployed, if the lira is at 5,000 or 1,500, the guys on the mopeds, does it matter if it's 5,000 or 1,500? It doesn't. These guys are unemployed, right? In fact, the system wants them to be unemployed. Why? One of the things that's not mentioned, remember I mentioned 30% unemployment average, 40% among youth. Who can tell me? What's the mandatory retirement age in Lebanon? Anybody know? 64. What is the unemployment rate of people between 60 and 64? Anybody know that? Take a guess. What do you think it is? Huh? Very low. What? Zero. Give me a number. Huh? 5%. 5%. Mine. Who else? 2%. Yeah, 2%. So the system is designed that if you're in a job, you don't get fired. If you're, if you're, if you're young, the system is designed for you to be unemployed, right? And what is the path for every one of you? I mean, if you're in the United States and you get a bachelor's from MIT, I mean, how many go on to grad school? Not, you can get a job from, with a bachelor's degree at MIT, right? How many, how many get a job from AUB? AUB is a top university in Lebanon. How many will get a job with a bachelor's degree from AUB right away? What percent? Do you know the number? There was a statistic a while ago that blew my mind that if you have tertiary education, like a, a you know, college or higher, you have a higher unemployment rate. It's five percent. If you graduate from the top university in Lebanon, you, you, the, the probability of you getting a job in Lebanon, in Lebanon, Lebanon or in the Gulf, even anyway, <laughs> it's five percent with the bachelor's. When I went to Colombia, the, un the, the employment rate was ninety-seven percent, three job offers per person within six months you know, before graduation. It's very clear. I pay the tuition. This is what I get. They don't publish it, of course, in Lebanon because it's not a very, very pretty statistic. But I'll tell you that the estimates that we've done is something like 5% of the bachelors. This is why all of you guys, every, pretty much every graduate at AUB, the path is to do a, a master's, right? And usually the master's has to be outside. And, I mean, let's be honest. What employed you, if you, you know, once you find a job, what employed you, the degree in Lebanon or the master's here? Okay? So, effectively, the system is designed to drive you out of the country. Okay? And the system is designed to drive you out of the country... Because they want you to send your remittances down there to support the 60 to 64 that are on 2% unemployment with the peg. So, back to your question. So, the system right now in Lebanon, out of every three people, one is unemployed. So, two are making 1,000. That's the per capita income. This guy's making zero. So, this system is designed that way because they want to drive this guy out to send remittances to subsidize your, your 1,000 and his 1,000. But the other alternative is if, if we have full employment, like here, 3.7% unemployment rate, then all three would make $666. So little less, little less, we spread around you. I'm not being socialist, but I'm saying that that's the alternative to this thing, right? So effectively, the 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 you know, the, the logic that it's going to create a riot because this guy's salary, these two are going to be, their salary goes down when this guy's been unemployed all along and nobody gave a damn, is obviously disingenuous, right? It's basically saying I don't care about the third guy, I want him out. What we care about is the existing, the survival, the survivors. We want to protect the survivors, but that's not taking the whole country into account. Does that make sense? And then if we start dissecting it along uh, regions, uh, if we look at the camps, if we look at women, then you can see where the, you know, who, who's being advantaged. And this brings me back to the, to the revolution, by the way. The beauty of this revolution, it's all about, it's the youth, the unemployed youth who no longer can get job opportunities like they did before, right? I mean, not everybody's going to get into MIT and, and go into, right? A lot of people, it's, they're stuck. They paid all this money 
to, to, to graduate from all these universities, many of which shouldn't exist, frankly. And, uh, and they're unemployed. They're smart people. They're much more aware than, than my generation, in my opinion. I like them more than I like me or my parents, because I think my parents were cheap. Okay? My generation ran away. And then these are the people that are looking to make a new level. And who's, who's the, who, so it's, it's, but who's driving it in this case? It's women. Right? Women. The, the big difference today with this movement is it's youth plus women. And if you look at the video, I tweeted this video where the, the, the army or the security forces were trying to arrest this guy. They were grabbing him because that's normal. They want to break his bones, right? And who's protecting him? Is it four women screaming and you know, trying to grab the guy, not letting him? And the, the security guys were like, they didn't know what to do because it was women getting involved. Like, what do we, sir, what do we do? Do we hit her? What, what do I do? You know what I mean? Because of the cultural uh, uh, impediments, you know what I'm saying? So effectively, this thawra, okay, is all about women and youth. And the alliance, and by the way, in my opinion, a lot of it has to do as well with women empowerment, right? So the, youth, you know, the alliance between youth and, and, and women has made this thing extremely powerful, in my opinion. So there's a generational, yeah, back to the unemployment rate of 2% versus 30%, so there's a generational war as well. And if you look at the guy who went on TV, the, the religious guy who said, I apologize on behalf, I don't know if you heard that, I apologize to all Arabs and Muslims about the behavior of our women. And, you know, I mean, when I was looking at it, it's like, I'm proud of the women. I'm like, when I see it, I beam at the way they, they've acted, right? This guy's apologizing. You have to apologize with apology, by the way. They want. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the haircuts? And <laughs> this is not money, man. That's not money. Uh, so you're, at, you're an MBA or a shul? I'm a, sorry, I'm Jad. I'm a second year MBA. Okay. Here at Sloan. Um, you know, a lot of what would the haircuts look like in your perspective, from a realistic perspective, in terms of how long will they take to be implemented, roughly? And if you look at the math, is are we? Is that one to four? Is that the ratio that nationwide, like across all the sum of money? Is that the ratio where the, the hair? No, I'm simplifying. Let me just remember, remember there's, assets other, there's assets other than that. I mean, this is the this is the actual real cash, but there's assets that are not liquid, like the loans that are involved. So you could solve the loan problem. Maybe get into the gold, maybe not. We'll see. I'd like not to get into the gold. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like a big fan of President Sarkis who bought them, and that's like the only asset that we didn't blow on, on, on bullshit, right? So, uh, you know. The way the way I told you the way it would look like the way it would the way it would look like in my opinion if we close it up to prevent more people running away we can make this quite equitable we can make it very fast and we can make it quite painless quite painless it will certainly improve the situation when you go to a gas station now I don't know if you, who was in Lebanon recently in the last few weeks nobody if you go to a gas station now you tell him fill fill up the car he'll say twenty twenty thousand and thirteen dollars. That's the limit. So they, they're, they're now rationing the gasoline because back to the because of the cartoon world. You, have you seen the movie uh, Roger Rabbit or one of those movies with cartoon characters and or zombies with humans, right? Like Lebanon today, we've got this cartoon world of the financial engineering of interest rates of twenty percent, and we've got the real world. And now these these characters that are that are that are fake are, are spilling out of the real world and causing shortages and syringes at hospitals, man, because because the guy with the twenty million believes he still has twenty million. So what, over a weekend, you don't, you don't have 20 million, man. You're lucky we're going to just keep 10 million. And he didn't earn them. This is, not, this is not money that went into a startup that invented a flip phone, okay? This is money that went to nothing. And it's one thing to innovate. You know, Zuckerberg invented Facebook with 2.7 billion users. You know what? He's worth, I mean, from a capitalist perspective, the guy's worth every penny, right? He invented something that everybody in here is using, yeah? Or the phone or whatever, right? What are these guys investing in to earn the 15, 20, 25 percent interest? Absolutely nothing. So if you take the money away by giving it a deferred tax, is that a big, is that a, is that unjust? What do you think? To to protect the system from this, you know, to protect the small depositor had nothing to do with mm -hmm. this whole thing. So, I mean, the implementation is another subject. I mean, the, if there's enough outrage in the street, and the outrage isn't about the Thawra land, or the, the problem with a lot of people you know, that are against the, the revolution, they don't realize they're getting hit. The guys on the mopeds are getting hit. Their parents are getting hit. And it's so widespread. This is not a Sunni thing or Shia or whatever. This is an everybody without exception. The teacher, the professor, the I don't know what, you know? Should I stop? <laughs> Okay. What, what can uh, the average person do to help 
the central bank or to help the government do you know move forward in that in, in, in a plan besides what we're doing right now which is protesting and you know sharing I, we have to ask for the we have to ask for the for the we have to ask for the capital draws does it make is there any reason not to do it who thinks it's a bad idea who believes them when they say it's a bad idea who believes it's good for the country not to have cap you know, official capital draws anybody give me the give me the counterfactual nobody I give you their counterfactual. No, give me yours. I, I know what their counterfactual is because the people think well, you'll stop sending money. Right, right, yes. Okay. You believe that? Yeah, if you're sending money to your dad, $500 a month to live on, you're going to stop? No. Okay. So it's bullshit. They can make rules for the new money, right? In yeah. fact, they've done it. They've already done it. They've said new money is not going to be subject to the old rules, right? So, okay. Any other reason not to do it? And you know what? You know, when they don't do it, what are they protecting? They're protecting the wasta, right? Yeah, the big guys. Okay, so that's it. So you have to start by stopping the leakages because the, the longer the leaks happen, the, the, the worse the haircut is going to be. In the middle of it's spreading. We need to operate immediately. So it sounds like the best case scenario is someone comes in, quickly puts in capital controls, you value the currency, whatever the whatever the or does it's the, the value. The value currency is another problem. Does the haircut or whatever it is. Yes. What's the worst case scenario? Okay, the worst case scenario, the worst you, you should want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we you might as well. The worst case scenario for you is that they deplete the reserves with carrying on the charade to the extent that we do not have enough money to buy food, fuel, syringes for hospitals. Yeah, in Venezuela, basically. You will start eating dogs in the streets. So that's the worst case scenario. And and the yeah, the I don't know what to tell you, but the worst part of it is avoidable. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's literally avoidable. It's a very simple decision, quick decision that can avoid all the stuff. And if we if we do the right thing, plus some other measures for the long term and medium term, yani, it's to stop. There's, there's more stuff that has to be done. This is like the emergency procedures. You also need stuff to stop our addiction to dollars. And for example, the way I would do it is I would tax V8, V6 cars. So the Range Rover in Lebanon would be $500,000. Okay, no V8, no V6. We have more Range Rovers in Lebanon than in London. And they, by the way. Yeah. yeah, you go to Lebanon, you'll see more Range Rovers in London, I guarantee you. She lives in London. Uh, we, so we tax them so heavily that nobody... Buy. And I'll tell you in a second, if you have doubts why that should happen, I'll tell you. So you reduce fuel consumption, which is one of our biggest imports. Okay, we have 170,000 domestic helpers in Lebanon, a country of 4 million. And in, uh, Robin, how many... How many you haven't lived in a domestic helper? Okay, from all the people you know that make a million pounds a year, how many have domestic helpers seven days a week that do your dishes That's and bring? Million. No, no. Million dollars a year. No, no. Manhattan, Manhattan, how many people? None. So in Lebanon, a middle class family has a domestic helper from the Sri Lanka. How about we do our own goddamn dishes? Okay, so you t this is three, four billion flowing out. So you tax them three thousand dollars a year, something like that, so that instead of one hundred seventy thousand, it becomes twenty, thirty thousand. Okay. The other thing is the conversion. Remember, public sector employees, 300,000? Each one of these guys is converting his lira salary and going to Turkey, right? Spend, giving it to Erdogan, right? Okay. How about you? How about departure tax? Humongous departure tax. And it, instead of, right now, they tax business class more than economy because it looks fair. But in fact, if somebody's going to Saudi Arabia on a business trip, is this guy going on tourism or is this guy going to bring money? Hajj. Hajj. Hajj is tourism, but you know what I'm saying. If, if a guy is going out on a business trip, you want to you wanna encourage it because this guy is bringing back dollars. The guy who's going to Mykonos, slap him, right? right. Um, how about one of you guys visiting Lebanon for three or four days? Should we tax that? No. Exactly. No. So Because we want to encourage you. We want to make it as cheap as possible for you to go so that you go stay at the Grey Hotel. You spend money there. You bring dollars, right? So that's... so. so that, yeah, instead of banning cigarette smoking, tax it. Tax it. That's you remember how they banned smoking inside? I, I would never ban anything. Just tax it. So, uh, maybe this is what you're implying, but why treat society differently than the euro bonds? Instead of the, the euro bonds? Uh, not, it's not because I'm a nice guy. It's because I'm uh, actually I'm, <laughs> I'm a pragmatic guy. I'll give you an example. Let's say you've got a credit card with $10,000 on a uh, limit. So you, you went, you had a re... You had a party and you spent four hundred dollars on it, right? Now you can't pay the four hundred. What what would it, would it would it be better to default on the four hundred and ruin your credit rating, your FICA score, everything for four hundred dollars, or would you run it up to ten thousand and do it? Which which is more rational? You're gonna ruin your name anyway. Forget the morality of you know. 
And that's it. So to me, the reason I don't want to blow our FICO score, the Lebanese FICO score, we've never defaulted ever, all because of five billion. By the way, the five billion are not worth five billion. You buy them in the market today, they're worth two and a half billion. All we have to do is send the Minister of Finance to, to have a we don't tell him to say anything, we should have a press conference, then we buy them at a billion dollars. Right? So you buy them at a billion and then you don't default. Now, why do I want to not ruin my credit? Because when the carnage happens that I'm talking about here, guess what we're gonna have to do? We have to go back to the market to borrow money, to spend it in an efficient way this time, to build a high-speed train, to, to you know what I'm saying, to do all the stuff that we should have done with the 20 billion that came in 2006 instead of these monstrosities that we can't sell. Does that answer your question? I think um, the market all else being equal, if we can avoid it, shouldn't we avoid it? Anyway, that's my view. I, I'm, I'm a minority on that, by the way. And I, I, I realize why you think the way you do, because I don't know anyone else. I know the guys at the Ministry of Finance don't agree with me. Nassim Talib wants to default now, November. So I'm, I'm a minority in this view. But again, it's pragmatic. It's, I'm not a nice guy. If, we, if, we ha if the foreigners own 30 billion, I would default. And the practicality is out those contracts, which, you know, local banks... Remember, the, the local banks... You know, you know how it happens. So I'll pay, I'll pay Euroclear, it goes to London, goes down to the bank, and then I just take it away from the bank. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I can do whatever I want here. Up here, when, when it's Ashmore that owns it, I'm going to pay him. You know what I'm saying? It's different. And again, not because I'm an ass guy, because I want to borrow from him later on at a low rate. That's why. On a more positive note, is there a way to get out of this without... No. So, for example, say the new government now uh, try to reduce the government uh, operating budget by imposing tax levies, like things you mentioned. Absolutely not. It, it, the the fiscal. Not, the, like, no, no. The fiscal. But you got to remember. You, you have to understand what the problem is. Oh, well, she, the fis, it's not a fiscal. Yeah, the fiscal deficit is not the major problem. Everybody talks about the fiscal. It's the balance of payment. That's the problem. And it, for example, in the last year, one said that went out of the country. One said that the value of said that went out of the country in the in the last year. So the balance of payment is that that's real dollars coming out. Excuse. So the Even fiscal. Even after the some of the schemes they introduced. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the balance of payment is the main problem. So you have to fix the dollar. That's real dollars. That's your money in the banks that's, that's leaving. Okay. The other problem is we're back to the moral hazard. But, and then there's the size. And I just gave you the whole. The whole in the central is 110 billion. And if they if they write us a check tomorrow. Okay, for sixty-five billion dollars, then we're then we're back to what everybody's talking about—the hundred fifty percent debt to GDP ratio, because nobody talks about this debt, and that's what you need as a bailout. Who's going to write you check sixty-five billion to bail out a guy that was earning fifteen percent interest when, 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 when everybody else is earning zero? It's not going to happen. Uh, I'm yes, I'm uh, HBS second year. Just uh, a lot of the measures you're speaking about is just to kind of uh, fix the fiscal situation within the banks. Just uh, going to the balance of payment issue, uh, which needs to be fixed on the long term. Like, what are the steps that you see to actually, because the balance of payment of the industry and our consumption stays the same, the deficit and balance of payment will always remain the same. So what are the steps that you think should be taken on a longer, medium to long term? Uh, it could start with import. Uh, you mentioned like stuff like to limit the... Tariffs, yeah. Th tariffs on, on, on luxuries. I already mentioned. I already mentioned that. That would reduce it by... I mean, that would... Almost balanced, by the way. Is there a composition of what the what are the main imports by percentage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuel. Yeah, yeah. There is that. I mean, the, the stuff that I told you about now would effectively end the uh, the, the, the it would balance the payments. Uh, who publishes those? Like there's the, a, there's a whole bunch of okay. I mean, there's a whole bunch of publications. It's not it's not a secret. And and the stuff I told you would would basically balance it. It would be done. Uh, but also on the long this is medium term. So we did the first, you know the short term is haircut. Medium term is this. If you think about it, you know the water pipe in Lebanon, and I'm an OCD guy, I look at it, you know where it's made? I looked at it the other day, Romania. And I'm thinking to myself, this is a new country, it has a cost basis lower than us, such that they construct something that they don't even understand, and, and sell it to us, but, you know, this, I mean, if you had to have a flag today of Lebanon, you'd probably put the Argili on it, right? <laughs> so these Romanians are making it cheaper than we can. So if, the, if, if we are more productive... Mm -hmm. yeah, more productive can happen in various ways, right? One of them is a devaluation. If we are more productive, we, you start making the argili in Lebanon. Now, it starts out with a, you get a uh, exhaust uh, pipe of a car. 
that's in the garbage and you get a hammer and you hammer it handmade and you make the argiri out of that. At the beginning, it's an artistic thing, right? Then you might develop quicker ways, etc. Of course, in the grand scheme of things, you want to go to the high, you know, the high value stuff. I mean, we, want, we need to do stuff which is what you guys are doing. There's, there are people that would love to do that. There's a guy here, an MIT graduate, who wanted to set up in there and there's so many impediments to this guy. So what we want to try to do is is you know is is to set up these things that are the you know the, the higher value type of uh, up the chain products. You see what I'm saying? So that's the long term thing. And it sells zeros and ones and whatever thought. But this long term won't happen without a new political system. I mean, I can guarantee all this. Uh, I can guarantee a fair field for all people. Yes and no. Yes and no. I mean, yeah. some of the stuff. Some of the stuff is so obvious. I mean, some of the stuff is so obvious that. And it, for example, the thing about the you know, the thing about the, what they did with the deposits, I mean, that affects every single person in Lebanon. It doesn't say it doesn't go by exact, right? So when people understand what was done to them by, by the bankers, this is not a sectarian thing. This was a this was a Madoffian thing, right? So that can still be solved, right? The tariffs, you know, yeah. I mean, there are some counter arguments to what I'm saying, right? Like, I mean, they can get to the sectarian stuff. Like, I, I like the tax vice. Okay, alcohol. So you got you there, there, there. An argument can be made that you're targeting one uh, ethnic group versus another, right? I mean, the, you know, if you want to, if you want to find holes in everything because of the sectarian thing, you can, right? I just have a question because uh, they said that the Arab banks are going to back out the Lebanese banks. They're going to do what? Back out uh, the banks. In the, okay. But that's my question because they are they they're going to bail us out? You mean? That's my question because they they just said this without any specific or who said that? Measures. Uh, I think the president of the uh, Jamaican Mossad, if I believe it. Uh, he explicitly said. Do you believe that, it? Exactly. So, <laughs> what do you think about it? Because he didn't mention anything. He's going to they're they're gonna run a check for 65 billion for the 15% interest? <coughs> Maybe. Hariri was in Marat, I think, in Germany. Uh huh. Hariri was before. They, they can get, look, yeah. the, pro, the problem is that a lot of people don't realize the size of the problem. Yeah. We were used to them sending us a, a $1 billion, $2 billion deposit, and that's the end of that, of Kiev. The problem now, you, people don't fathom the size of the hole in the country. I mean, it's humongous by any standard. You don't understand what, I mean, 60, and it, you know what 65 billion? I mean, that's like I mean, the foreign aid to Israel, right, over 10 years is less than half that. So if they bail us out, the Americans, that means they're going to give us more money than the largest foreign foreign aid recipient in the world. I mean, it's ludicrous to even fantasize about it. Um, two questions. One is regarding the worst case scenario that I described earlier. Given the current bleed and all else equal, what's the runway that we have right now before the you know, doomsday scenario that you, that you described uh, happens? And second question is, what what do you see the role of petrol and the okay. recovery period, if it has a role. The, the, the first, the first question of the lab, you know, they, they just have to do. They just have to start with the capital controls, and then you, when, once you do the capital controls. I'm saying if we didn't do the capital controls, uh, uh, and if we stayed the way we are, no, how, what, how much time do we have? Uh, how much time do we have? This is a very, this is a difficult question to ascertain. And according to the report just done now by a American bank, they think uh, they think mid, you know, they think in the, what they say February or March or some of that. You yeah. know what I mean? I don't, we don't know the exact numbers of the usable reserves to know the exact number, but what we do know is that the behavior of the market is very suspicious. It's like, it's almost like there's less money than we think we do have. And when you go to, somebody on my Twitter wrote, she, she's got $150,000 in the bank. She went to the bank, they got some money. The guy gave her 50 bucks. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if that's not a haircut, I mean, what do I care if you give me a statement? I can't take out my money. You know what I mean? I mean, I've got, I'm on a group of, I, I retired as, Five years ago, CEO. So I'm in a group of retired people. Or, you know, the average age is dead. And <laughs> and this one guy, you know, it's like, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm gonna travel. I can't travel now because they, you know, limited my money. To... This guy's a multi-millionaire. They limited him three hundred dollars a, a, a week. You understand? I mean, can you imagine you a multi-millionaire? I used to ski with this guy. We go on the Alps, etc. Now this guy is limited. He can't travel. I mean, do you, do you understand? It's like most, you know. So when people tell me about you know, we'll do this and do that. And that's already in front of you, you know, like you can't read it just because he hasn't told you. It means it's not there, right? I mean, if it's raining on top of you and somebody says it's not raining, you believe him? But this petrol, let me give you, I, I was writing an article, I've done my research on this one. I just haven't written it because we got, we got distracted with some other stuff. But let me give you the numbers. So there's 38% probability we'll find that. Okay? 
And this came from, like I said, I met with the EU advisor. I met with the guy at the Ministry of, of Energy. I met with the, a bunch of experts. So I, I had, I met with Loggy, the transparency organization. So four or five sources. 38% probability that we'll find out. If we do find something, seven to 10 years before we get the first penny. If we get the first penny, it's somewhere between 1.6 and $3.6 billion a year. So it doesn't even cover the fiscal deficit. So the, the oil and gas is not the answer. Moreover, and I wrote an article about the resource curse, in my opinion, it's the worst thing that can ever happen to us. And if you look at the Gulf countries, right? Think about the Gulf countries five, you know, 500 years ago, right? So this is a guy where the temperature is 120 degrees Fahrenheit, walking through the desert with no water, right? There's no food. So he has to go walk for days without food or water, right? And survive. So can you imagine how fit this person was, how tough this first person was, right? Now, fast forward to when they found oil, the obesity rate in, in the Gulf now is so high, right? Right? Basic stuff, you know, you know, it's no longer the, 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 the sword, the bent sword, right? And it, you know what I'm saying? I, I mean, would you go to MIT when you, you, you know, you, you get, I mean, assuming it's not, it's not enough money to do that, but let's say it is. I mean, you know, like that would disincentivize you. Just like it disincentivized my friends from, from moving to Dubai to take my place, right? Because mm -hmm. they were making so much money in the Ponzi scheme. I mean, the quality of experience this guy had was really bad. He's no longer competitive because he wasn't doing anything. What, 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 is the, what is the business model for a banker in Lebanon? Get deposits from you guys, right? And then give it to the central bank. Wow. I mean, that is a skill set for 10 years of experience, right? And he didn't, they didn't do derivative trading, capital markets, <laughs> IPOs, they didn't do anything, right? So what's a banker been doing for the last 10 years? This guy's going to apply. I've got 10 years of experience in Lebanon taking deposit from expats, giving the central bank where he does this Kama Sutra thing. Yeah. Yes. So I think we have some new bonds which are which mature in two days. Uh, so like, what's, what's going on? That is the, that is the $64,000 question, my friend. <laughs> so uh, they've said they're going to pay them. Okay. The market thinks they're going to pay them. There's about, I think there's about, you could make like, Last guy that traded can you know makes an easy five percent by betting on it. But the funny thing about this is everybody thinks they're gonna pay. They said they're gonna pay. They have the money to pay, right? But everybody thinks they're not gonna pay the April, right? So in you know rationally, if they if they're gonna default in April, should they pay the November? Back to the credit card example. Back to your example, right? Should they pay November if they're gonna default in April? Doesn't make sense. That's the that's my point, right? So in my mind, uh, it's I don't know. <laughs> it's irrational. It's irrational. Yeah, it's irrational to pay November and default in April. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that we don't do irrational stuff. The whole, the whole system. When I've talked to people, by the way, just give you the other side of the coin. When I've talked to people from the BDL, these guys, I mean, these guys, first of all, they don't think they have a choice with the Fed. So they believe, that in their viewpoint, they are trying to, they are under siege and they're trying to survive. So in their mind, if they survive a year with the Fed, great. If they survive three years, fantastic. If they survive three years, they should write Iliads about it, right? So, but so they're not looking at the price that's being paid along the way because their view is that's my mission. You, you get my drift? So that's their viewpoint. So their viewpoint is I got no choice on this stuff. stuff. I got to go on, and I'm I'm a hero if I last long, no matter what the price. Just regarding the fact you mentioned that um, the central bank has around 30, 35 billion in uh, U.S. currency, and they have the gold that they can liquidate if they wanted. No, they can't. That requires an aswan. Uh, eventually, like within a year yeah. or two. Like, like not the it, required, no, it requires a, a, a sultan. As a sultan, yeah. they could liquidate it if there is a need. Yes. Um, and at the same time, the balance of payment per year, you said something like 12 billion uh, of deficit. Why didn't the central bank intervene? Because it seems that they have a lot of reserves to defend the peg, even at, at its most aggressive, uh, basically, deficit of balance of payment for like two or three years, assuming they deplete all of the... the all of their reserves. So why, why did they let the black market? Why, why did they let think, the black market? Yes. Why do you think it's devaluing, given that it has stained uh, everything that the central bank has done over the last 30 years? Okay. Like I find some, like in their, the way they behave, it's completely irrational. Right. I'm going to answer your question. At the beginning, I thought, I mean, I, in fact, I wrote something about this in, towards the end of last year. I, I made a claim where I said, I don't think they have what they say they have. Okay. And then I talked to them and, um, uh, really grilled them. And I came to the conclusion that they're telling the truth. I believe I believe that they have 30, 35 billion. So the question is, why did they let it, the, the, the two-tier market? A couple of reasons. Number one, I, by the way, I encourage them to do it. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. But the, 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 
their answer was, well, I'm not going to wait to the last second. I got to take, you know, I'm not going to wait till you know the last minute to start taking steps. I need to start taking steps now. So in their view, they're preparing for the eventual. Even if they have two, three years, they don't want to lose them now. So they want to ration the. You know, they want to ration the reserve. That's number one. Number two, the, the, the two-tier system, in theory, the two, if you think about the two-tier system, the two-tier system effectively is a face-saving way to de-peg, right? And I say I, it's 15.07 and a half. You go in, you get some stuff at 15.07, then you get the Saraf, and oh, that's the Saraf's fault. It's the market. We don't have enough paper. Yeah, there's a lot of Lebanon. It's true, but with the, the, the actual effect in practicality, it's reducing the confidence in the banking sector in a way that as soon as all of this lifts, there will be a huge capital flight that's caused, which basically doesn't allow them to continue that plan going. That should, don't, there's, there's two tiering. You need to separate the, the banking sector from the bank. There's two different things. Because there is a confidence that links them. I, I understand the difference. No, no, no. In, 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 no. in practice, the average Lebanese in practice believe the narrative Okay, that the Saraf is being uh, uh, greedy or whatever. It's not true, obviously, because you can tell from the bid offer. If the bid offer is 20 or 40, it means the guy is not making excessive amount of money, right? However, the average Lebanese, remember there was a lot of, they, they, the, 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 the ISF arrested some of them. Do you remember that? Really? Because they don't, these other guys don't understand. They didn't go to MIT, you know, at Sloan or whatever, right? So this guy thinks, oh, the guy is selling at 1800, I'm going to go arrest him, right? Yes. He doesn't understand that that's a market thing. So they, they let him go because somebody called and said, look, let him go. They didn't do anything. You know what I mean? So what I'm saying is that in the Lebanese narrative, as long as if you go to the bank and you can convert, and you can do that tomorrow. You can go to the bank tomorrow and convert your dollar, your lira into dollars at 15.07 and a half. They'll tell you to freeze it for a year and a half, right? Today, But they'll convert it. So, they con so it's still 15. And they can claim that it's still 15.07 and a half. And for the average Lebanese guy, the average Lebanese guy today is losing confidence not because of the peg in the, sec in the secondary market. They're losing confidence because they can't pull their money out. It's a different Yeah, story. and with this contamination, right? Because at the end of the day, if they didn't, if the banks allow you to tishab nusriyatak adma biddak, wa andak al sarraf bi al alf al dollar bi al fainu mitain, you have an arbitrage opportunity in one street of Hamra. So the reason, so basically you cannot have a secondary market without having uh, a supply restriction on the amount of, if, you, if the banks are going to hold one dollar is equal to al and the uh, sarrafin one dollar is equal to al fainu mitain, the banks cannot keep the cash flowing. That's this is why this two-tier system contaminated the, the dynamic. I don't of the think bank. it's that. I think they just simply did not have the dollars anymore. I mean, remember that's not just about that. You can't transfer outside the country. That's not a, that's not a conversion. If you cannot transfer money to MIT here, your parents can't send you money here. That's got nothing to do with the, with the Fed. That that means there's not enough dollars. That's an electronic dollar, right? That's not a paper. If possible, I'll take it offline. Do you see any of certain banks in Lebanon being affected more or differently than others in Lebanon? No, the quick answer is no. However, some banks are like the ratio I like to look at in Lebanon. You know, you got these ratios you could look at. You, you, you know this stuff better than me because you're fresh from business school. But there's one ratio I like I look at which is special for Lebanon, which is I look at the deposits and how much of the deposits are with the central bank. Okay, and this is on the balance sheet. So there's one bank, for example, that is quite famous, and they have about 88% of the deposit central bank. Okay, the average we said is 110 divided by 170, and 65%, right? So if you're below 65, it means you didn't play in Disneyland as much. And if you're above 65, you played in Disneyland. The more you play in Disneyland, the more you're exposed. However, you gotta remember, in the grand scheme of things, whether you're this guy or this guy, you, most of the dollars are with the banks. Other than the, the stuff at the custodial banks, and there's a couple of banks that have more liquidity with the custodial banks. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not a lot. And if, let's assume the best case scenario, 9 billion. 9 billion divided by, you know, there's 60 banks in Lebanon. Let's call, let's say, 50, let's say 20. I mean, let's not look at the small one. And it's not a lot of money, 450 million per bank. Huh? It's not a lot of money of liquidity. And some of them have 700, others have 50, right? So yeah, the guy who has 700, but in the grand scheme of things, neither number is, is great for the amount of, of demand. So and I would I would say that the banking sector has to survive as a whole. You cannot have and they're big. The banks are huge, huh? Twenty six billion in deposits, something like that, and nobody can bail them out. So in, in in a sense, look, if we mark the loans to market and the euro bonds and all that stuff, you know we've got a problem with every single bank, right? So clearly we we don't want to do that. And you can have zombie banks go on forever, right? Look at Japan and Italy. So it's not the first time in history where where banks keep going. You know, so we, there are ways you can do this uh, without having a major 
tissue. Okay? And I, and I think that's not necessarily unwise in a country where the, the deposits are so big. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, Hamid Mwemba, MIT senior. Sorry, what's your name? Hamid Mwemba. Yep. I'm a senior at MIT. Um, so can you talk about... What's your last name? Mwemba. Are you related to the famous guy? Yeah, in some way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shit! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so can you just talk about them with the haircut and the capitalist and all So the part? Hariri is absolutely the best guy. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, so can you talk about the, with the haircut and the capital control? Is this, does the central bank also need to like cut rates? Is it able to uh -huh. pursue that? Absolutely. So if you if you're a prisoner, do you get paid the same hourly rate as a McDonald's worker outside? No. Exactly. So the beauty of the capital once you do the capital controls, right? And once you decide, you know, the the, okay. the remittance that he's going to send his parents is going to come in. The guy who's sending what's called capital transfer, yeah, the guy who's going to invest, that guy's probably going to be, anyway, either he's not going to send or you, you're going to have to give him his separate account. And that's already happening, by the way. They're setting up accounts like this. So you can play around with it. But the guys with trapped dollars in there, but already they're pissed off, right? So you can actually reduce the rates to whatever you want them to do. So the answer to your question, and this is, this is not a bad thing. Because remember, we've got a lot of, I mean, when, the, when we finish with this banking problem, we also have a major problem of businesses closing. Unemployment increases. Remember, the public sector stays the same, but the tax base, the public, private sector is losing employees every day. And a lot of that is because of the debt and the interest rates. So one of the things we should do is definitely, when we reduce the interest on deposits, we reduce the interest on loans, we can start being patient with these guys, and then we can start rebuilding or at least saving some of these businesses from, from failure. So the answer to your question is absolutely that that should go hand in hand. That's and it forces reduction. Yeah, the only thing that confuses me is if we cut the rates, that makes like... Are Lebanese lira less attractive than men? Like, are we able to keep, keep it? You, do you believe that the peg exists still? No. Tell us. Next, I mean, you know, I mean, for the average guy, you can keep lying to him and telling him it's 15 or 7 and a half, right? Yeah. But, I mean, you guys know that on, on a practical level, it's, it's, it's now toast, right? So the issue is what, is, what is the fair value, right? That's all we have to ask now. And by the way, do we need a peg? Why should we have a peg? I mean, what, what's wrong? I mean, uh, to me, a floating currency is is a like a thermometer. It measures, it measures your temperature, right? If you've got ice on your head all the time, if you're sick, you don't know you're sick, right? So what happened was because of the peg, we we are now much less productive than we than we would have been, you know. And in my mind, for example, back to 2006, what should have happened? They should have floated. If they floated the currency, the dollar would have gone to 1,000. You know that, right? Yeah. And then this would reduce this bubble. And then in 2011, you start devaluing 1100, 1200, 1500. By now, it's 2000, and we're done. Nice, beautiful. Now, obviously, this is a retroactive <laughs> vision. I, I'm not going to say that if I were there, I would have known. But in, in retrospect, this would have been the, the, right, the, the right way to do it, right? Sorry. Uh, we're seeing uh, we're a massive supply chain management at MIT. Uh, I know that you said that this is not like, the most optimal solution, but like, just to understand, there is no way that you will, you will be able to bring back the stolen money. No, I, I didn't say there's no way to claim back the stolen money. I, I, all I'm saying is that that is a uh, more complicated... And there's two types of stolen money. Okay, there's one stolen money and the one that... You know, the suitcases and the bribes and this type of stuff. And by the way, there's not as much as you think outside. I mean, why? if you're a Lebanese politician, right, in Lebanon, and you made a lot of money out of this stuff, do you really believe that you needed to go to Switzerland with the money? I mean, think about it. The bank secrecy laws in Lebanon are some of the tightest in the world, right? So you didn't need to. You buy land. I mean, nobody. I mean, this is very new now, where they go in and you, you know, you have an exposure of the guys' real estate holdings and it goes on TV. I mean, this is quite new. We didn't used to do that because of social media and leaks and stuff like that. There's a much more transparency than before. But and by the way, I'm going to ask you this: There's been a lot of leaks from a lot of banks outside. How many leaks have come out of Lebanese banks of people's accounts? Have you ever seen it? So who's tired? Yeah, if you were a politician, you want to hide your money. You're going to go to, I mean, how many leaks have happened out of all the Swiss banks, European banks? Right? Many. But not one out of Lebanese bank. So if you're a politician, why should you take it anywhere else? The secrecy laws are tight. The interest rates are higher, right? You know the banker. You can drink a cup of coffee when you go in, right? So in, in other words, I don't think there's a lot of, I don't think there's a lot of this money as much as you think outside. There's a little bit for sure, but not, not that much, in my opinion. So... 
But in any event, the recovery of that is a more complicated problem to do. It. You got to prove it, and you got to admit, you know, you got to submit the petition and so forth. But there's another part of what I call stolen money. The guys that came in with the financial engineer in 2016 made 25 percent, doubled their money, and went and went out. You know what I'm saying? That's an interesting case. On what charge? On what basis do we ask back? Can we do a retroactive law? You know what I mean? Can it? In my mind, it's the, if it's a Ponzi, that's the that's the that's the reason, right? Because this the guy's money that he made, the 25%, was basically your money when you stayed. So is that enough of a case to, to ask for it internationally back? So that one, yeah, I think we should that one we should go after those, because that's a lot of money that went out. A lot of fake money. But that became real money. Uh, Sita Haja, fourth year PhD student. <laughs> In what, what major? Mechanical engineering. Okay. Um, do, is there an estimate, if we were to haircut everyone the same, of what the haircut would be to cover? Uh, it's, it's, it, would, it would take a little bit of work. And it, we did some back of the envelope thing, and we said, you know, maybe 40, maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 percent. There are people working on it assuming 15, 20. I think it's higher. And there's people like my friend Hassan Khalil, he thinks it's much, much more, you know. So it's 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 work in progress. But we know there's gonna be one. I don't think there's anybody. I don't think there's anybody that's not lying or an idiot that would not tell you there's a haircut. Okay, in all honesty, and anyone who tells you that there's not gonna be a haircut. And when I say haircut, remember I'm including the different definitions, huh? And if if I don't pay you for 20 years, that's a haircut. Let's just be clear what I mean by a haircut. So anybody that tells you none of that's gonna happen and you're gonna get all your money and it's normal, is either lying or or, or an idiot. Simple as that. Last question, I guess. I have a question on Spanish. Oh, Emma Solomon, I was atheist. Um, this might be anecdotal, uh, but I felt like one Why are you interested in our little banana republic? <laughs> no, <laughs> I should have been from the team. Oh, okay. Whoop. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name again? Emma. Emma, okay. Um, Langley? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, so last year, this is totally anecdotal, but when they stopped the scan, I saw like a real ripple effect. Mm -hmm. um, people couldn't buy houses, like normal people can't buy houses, but also like uh, electricians, people working in, you know, all the industries that support the, the construction, it all stopped, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you think that, I don't know, what the scan people think? Like, what okay, I am, you don't understand how much I thought that was the most idiotic thing ever, the subsidized loans, because here's what happened. So 2006, you know, you saw what happened in the United States because of subprime loans, right? So we don't do it in Lebanon. 2008, we actually receive a prize that we avoided subprime. And guess what happens? We start subprime. Subprime loans. Effectively, ninja loans, uh, fraud, all kinds of stuff. And it, it created, it created the, aggravated the bubble. People were taking floating rate loans that they didn't understand that were frozen. There were no, no down payments. There was fraud and letters being written. I mean, there was all kinds of stuff that happened which, which aggravated the bubble, especially with no transparency. It was the most terrible thing that ever happened, by the way. So the answer to your question is, I, I don't mind doing, you know, certain programs that help out, uh, uh, you know, limited income people and so forth. But this was a very bad idea. It aggravated the bubble. It was already a bubble, and, and they should have reduced the prices. They should have introduced transparency, like here in the U.S. MLS listing, right? If you want to buy an apartment here in Cambridge over there, you know exactly what the price was paid right next to you in the whole history of it. In Lebanon, you and I can go to the same building, same apartment, and you would overpay by 30 or 40 percent in the same day. So before you, we talk about anything like that, the first thing that should have happened is, is to provide transparency so that people know what they're paying for. So... I, I, this scan was a bad idea in the way it was done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.